Well, thank you, friends. If you have your Bibles, if you could turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, read from verse 17 through to verse 21. It's always good to focus our thoughts first and foremost on God's precious word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Reading from verse 17, this is the word of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Beloved, like yourselves, I am just a sinner saved by grace. And it is thanks to Calvary and the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross that I no longer walk the road of sin, rebellion, and disobedience, and death that I once walked. And when and where I go back to that road uh, this evening, I do so not the glory in a dark, shameful past, but to simply show you how by God's grace I am where I am today. Um, I come originally from East Belfast in Northern Ireland. For those of you who would be interested, um, famous for the Titanic. I was perfectly okay when it left Belfast. Uh, also famous for C.S. Lewis. For those of you more culturally, culturally refined, Van Morrison comes from East Belfast. Gary, the late Gary Moore, uh, rock guitarist. Uh, George Best um, played for Man United. Those of you who really into your football, David McCreary, who played for Man United. Um, I went to school with David. We were in primary school together, played football with him. And uh, for those of you who are really into your football, uh, Derek Duggan, who played for Wales, uh, played for Wolves. He came from our uh, neck of the woods. But um, it was into that part of East Belfast where I was born in the 1950s. Mum and dad, older sister, older brother, myself, and then a younger sister. And it was a very loving, very happy, very uh, secure home. Jeff in his book remembers his mum going about the house cleaning and singing gospel hymns. Well, I remember my mum going about the house cleaning and she would sing country songs. And I've got a, a love for country music today. I mean, listen to my mum singing country songs as she cleaned. Um, but that happy home um, became uh, a sad home in 1970, just at the outbreak of the Troubles, as it became known in Northern Ireland. Uh, Saturday, the 27th of June, 1970, 52 years ago, and Monday week, and it's like yesterday. Um, my mum came up uh, that Saturday morning. She woke me up and asked if I would like to go for a walk with my dad, who was going um, for a morning walk. And she said, would like to join him? And I got up and went, went with him on, on this walk. Um, we spent the, the whole morning together and the uh, early part of the afternoon and hold so many, many precious memories for myself. And yet at the same time, very sad memories because that night, just as the troubles were starting to escalate in the province, um, my dad was shot dead by the, the IRA. I was around about half 11 that night. I was out in the street waiting on my dad coming home. It was a, it was a night as warm as this. And um, there was a blast of automatic gunfire. Little did I know that was my dad being killed. And the gunfire continued right through the whole night, didn't, didn't stop. 
And um, I was pulled into a neighbor's house. As I was sitting in the neighbor's house, um, people were coming and going. I was sitting on an armchair with my, with my eyes closed. They thought I was sleeping. And as people were coming in and going out, there was hushed whispers. It's terrible. It's awful. Uh, does he know? And um, I remember getting up and saying, what's awful, what's terrible, and running out the door and running up the street. And I can still see the tracer bullets. And my friend's dad stepped out and grabbed me. And uh, I was saying, where's my daddy, where's my daddy? And he said, Billy, your daddy's not coming home. Your daddy's dead. And I, I remember distinctly saying to him, well, this is God's will. And he grabbed me by the shoulders and he literally, he nearly shook the life out of me. And he said, there is no God. And he used an expletive and he referred to the Roman Catholic community across the road and he says, it's them across there. Never you forget that there is no God. And so at the age of 12, basically I wrote God out of my life. Because if there was a God who was all powerful and all loving, he could have stopped the pain that had just entered into our lives. The, the time of the shooting, my mother was three months pregnant. And six months later to the day, my kid brother was born. And the, the darkness that entered the home um, it was like a cancer, as was the hate and the bitterness. It just grew. There was an insatiable longing for revenge. I can still remember my young brother running in off the street when he was around three or so, three or four, running in off the street, running up to my mum and asking what a daddy was. How come his friends in the, in the street had a daddy to talk about and he hadn't? Where was his daddy? And to see my mum break down in tears, trying to explain why there was no father figure in the home. So seeds of hatred and bitterness to a greater degree and greater extent. And come 1974, I joined a loyalist paramilitary organization, a loyalist terrorist group. And I don't need to go into any gory details about what terrorists got up to. Sadly, we live in a world where we're all too familiar with terrorist activity. Um, my family were supportive of me to go into that group. Uh, my older brother was also involved in a terrorist organization. Uh, that was our reaction to the death that had come to our door as a result of terrorism. I, I, I know there are many families touched as a result of the violence that has emanated from Ireland. Not every family reacted the way my family reacted, but we reacted with hate. And um, my mum often said, were it not for the fact that she had a little baby to look after, she would have been involved in terrorism. After my dad was killed, uh, she stopped singing. She said she had nothing to sing about. And so there was this longing for revenge. And I remember the night I joined the terrorist group, I went into the bar where this group met. And um, the commander of this little unit come up and he said, there were three of us joined that night, and he said, um, what do you want to do? And I said, well, the only thing I want to do is kill. And he, la he laughed and he made a gesture with his hand like that to about maybe 50 or 60 young lads behind him. And he said, you just got to wait your turn. And that's what I find frustrating, that I, I was in a queue. Um, I trained in bomb making simply because you can kill more people with a bomb than you can with a gun. And um, come 1975, it was myself and the young lad that we joined together. We were approached and asked if we would carry out a shooting, an IRA man. And uh, we were game, yeah, we will do that. And uh, we were told to be on standby. But the, uh, it didn't come off. And uh, February 76, we were approached again. And we were told the shooting was back on. We still game to do it. 
Yeah, of course we are. And I said, there's two things we need to explain. One, it's not an IRA man. He's actually a member of our own organization. He was a fellow UVF man, but he was an informer. And uh, if we didn't want to do the shooting because he was one of our own, they would understand it. We'd get somebody else to do the shooting, but no, we know the rules. If you inform, it's an immediate death sentence. So if this guy was an informer, then he had to be taken out. The other thing they said was, we only need one of you to do the shooting because it's a punishment shooting. The provost marshal's going to do it. So it can only be one of you. And me and my mate then start arguing about who was going to be the one to do this shooting. And uh, the guy, the commander of the organization, pulled a, a coin out of his pocket. He tossed it. And I think I called heads or whatever it was, but um, I got to do the shooting because I got the call. We know it says in Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast, the coin is tossed if you like, but it's every decision is from the Lord. And I go out February uh, the 19th, 1976, very early in the morning, along with an accomplice in a derelict street in Belfast, and very coldly, without any mercy, without any twins of conscience, very brutally, bloodily, uh, take the life of another human being that was created in God's image. But as far as I was concerned, I had now proven myself within the organization, I'm going to go on a killing spree. And uh, I was arrested within a space of two weeks, by the grace of God, and found myself in the maze prison. The young lad who lost the the toss, a year later he was blown up by his own bomb in Corporation Street in Belfast. And I often wonder if, um, if he had called the right call and done the shooting, would it, have me, would it have been me brushed off the streets of Belfast that night and put in a plastic bag and then a box? So I was arrested, found myself in a maze prison. I was either going to go to prison for a very long time or end up dead. When I was in prison, um, carried on, you know, uh, the interest in terrorism, read books in terrorism, all to come out a better educated terrorist. Um, started to study politics into communism. I believe that uh, communism would have been the answer for Ireland. The last thing Ireland needed was the Bible, you know, religion's Ireland's problem. So uh, what does Ireland need? Ireland needs Mr. Marx. And I studied, you know, for years Marxism. I was uh, sentenced in 1977, I was too young to be given a life sentence. So I was uh, detained under the Secretary of State's pleasure. And uh, I found myself in the Mays prison. Uh, I found myself in the eight blocks of the Mays prison. Now, if any of you are familiar with the history of the province, emanating from the eight blocks were the Republican protests. There was the blanket protests where the, they just sat with a blanket wrapped around them. And then it escalated to the dirty protests where they were smearing their excrement around the cell walls, and then finally to the hunger strike. So all of that comes from the H blocks. So I was in the H blocks, having been sentenced to what amounted to a life sentence. It was only there a matter of weeks when um, a fellow prisoner arrived called Peter Thompson. Now Peter and myself were on remand, I knew him well. But when Peter arrived in the H blocks after having been sentenced, he was, uh, he was carrying one of these. He was carrying the Bible, and he was talking about Jesus, which I thought was very convenient because he's just been given a life sentence. He wants to get out of prison early. How is he going to get out of prison early? We'll show the authorities that he's now a good guy. He's carrying a Bible instead of a bomb. But uh, as far as I was concerned, Peter was a hypocrite. He was a phony. Couldn't face up to the pressures of the penal system. He needed a crutch to lean on, and this is a really convenient crutch. 
Now, Peter, when he arrived on the eight blocks, appointed himself the block barber. So if you needed a haircut, you had to send for Peter. And when Peter started to cut your hair, he had a really novel approach to evangelism. He used to get the scissors and he would put them into the side of your neck and he would be applying quite a bit of pressure like, and he would, and he would say, right, just another little, little bit of pressure and I'm into your juggler. And you're lying here in a pool of blood and by the time they get a medic down here to stem the flow of blood, you're dead and you're in hell because you're not a Christian. Now, what about that for evangelism? And see if you're a good commie and you just wanted, you know, to get the hair cut. You were saying, Peter, would you, would you just give over and cut my hair like? But, you know, that was Peter's approach to, to evangelism. Now, you see around about 1978, letters arrived, okay? Um, one of the, some of the letters, one, a girl that uh, we used to knock about with, there was a wee group of kids knocked about together when we were in our teens, and one of these girls um, was always asking my mum how I was doing, and she said, would Billy mind if I wrote to him? And in uh, 1978, she started to write to me, and she wrote every day, and she started to visit and she visited every week. That was one of the letter, part of the letters that came. But also around this time, there were letters that arrived from New Zealand. They came in a long brown envelope. And I remember pulling the contents out of this envelope. And I caught the name of Jesus somewhere in the corner. And I put it back inside the envelope, curled it up in a ball and threw it in the waste paper bin. I had absolutely no time for God. I had no time for religion. Six or eight weeks later, another one of these magazines, postmarked New Zealand, stamped New Zealand, handwritten address to myself in its block seven of the Mays prison. I know what's inside it. It's one of these religious magazines and it goes into the bin. My friends, see to this day, I do not know anybody in New Zealand. Uh, that's just how it is. Um, and they're, they're coming every six or eight weeks and throwing them in the bin. Peter Thompson's still running about the place with his novel approach to evangelism. And I think, well, if Peter's into this religious carry on, instead of these magazines going in the bin, I'll give them to Peter. And that's exactly what it did. As soon as the magazines reached myself, I knew where they were from, I knew what was inside it, give it back to the prison officer and said, give that to Peter Thompson. August of 1980, I go out to the medical room one night at a blinding headache. Who was in the medical room but Peter Thompson? And I happened to say to Peter, I hope you're getting the magazines that I'm sending across to you. I don't know who's sending them, Peter, but you're quite welcome to them. And even before Peter could answer, the medical officer looked up and he said, oh, do you not think it's God sending you these magazines? And I thought, well, we'll write one here. You know, God sending magazines from New Zealand <laughs> to the Mays prison. And I said to this medical officer, look, I'm pretty skeptical about God. I do not believe that God exists. Nine out of ten times, if I had said to a Christian, I'm skeptical about God, I don't believe God exists, they would come back at me with Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So I was waiting and this medical officer calling me a fool. I was going to throw him a line of argument, get my head of tablets and get off side. He looks at me and he says, you're skeptical about God. And I said, that's right. You don't believe God exists. And I said, that's right. He's going to call me a fool because you can read these Christians like a book. And he looked at me and he said, well, I want to tell you something, kid. Regardless of whether you believe in God or not, doesn't take away the fact that there is a God. Nor does it take away the fact that if you die, in the state that you're in at the moment, you're going straight to hell. And once you get there, kid, you're not going to be skeptical anymore. He says, in fact, everybody in that place believes. And he said, the tragedy of it is this, that once you are there, there is no release date. You're there forever. I couldn't hit him with a line of argument for 
you know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He had wrong foot at me, and I turned and I hightailed it out of that medical room. As I thought about it, if there's a heaven and a hell, no argument, I know where I'm going, but is there a heaven and a hell? Is there a God? What religion's right? You know, I could go on the rest of the night about the amount of religions in this world. And here I am in this prison encountering these Christian prison officers and some of these Christians who have become Christians. And you know what's really annoying about them is their dogmatism and their arrogance. You know, their, their, their Bible's the only Bible. Their way's the only way. Their Jesus is the only Jesus. Nobody else gets a look in. And I'm asking all sorts of questions following this in conversation with the uh, medical officer in the medical room. And what I can't give an adequate explanation for, even up to the present day, those magazines that had been coming on a regular basis every six or eight weeks since 1978, never received another one. I never read one of them, and I never received one, another one. It's as freaky as that, but that's just how it happened. Christmas Eve 1980, a woman came down in my cell, a woman called Gladys Blackburn. If she was standing up here behind this pulpit, you wouldn't see her. She was so small. She was a retired school teacher. Comes down to my cell Christmas Eve 1980, after a bit of formal conversation, she lifts down the Bible, starts to read from Luke chapter 23, and a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the thieves, which was hanged, grilled at him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering her good him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing we are in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly? For we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And she stopped at that first. She said, I want you to think who Jesus Christ is calling Lord. I want you to think who this thief is calling Lord. And she began to walk to describe what Jesus Christ must have looked like on the cross. Um, she held up her three fingers. Uh, she had a cyst on her finger. And she was saying, you know, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his, his, his sin, uh, his blood covered our sin. And uh, that cyst that's on my finger, you can't see it anymore because Jesus Christ has covered it. And she was given these little pictures of, um, you know, what Jesus was doing on the cross. But what was... What was going on in my own thinking, in my own heart, as she was explaining that, was for the first time in my life, I felt an overwhelming sense of guilt. I never felt, I'd never felt guilty before. If you had met me in prison and said, Billy, were you justified in taking the life of another human being? See, in a warped way, I would have justified my position. And you'd have thought, you know, that guy's a few marbles loose, and you would have been right. Like, But I would have been thinking that I was perfectly logical and explaining that I was justified in taking the life of another individual. But that night I realized no justification for what I had done. I was a sinner and I was under God's condemnation and yes, I deserved hell. And I, was real, I realized that Jesus Christ on the cross, he who knew no sin, he who was innocent, was taking the rap for me. He was taking my punishment and it was as clear as that. And that woman, uh, she, she was reading a few verses of scripture. I remember her reading John 6, 37. All that the Father give to me will come to me. He who comes unto me, I will never turn away. And she got up and left my cell. That night, Christmas Eve, 1980, I got down on my knees on the cell, eight block seven of the maze prison. And I threw a waste of life before God. I repented of my sin. Um, She'd left a little gospel tract, and I think there was a, a, a sinner's prayer in the back of the tract. It was probably the most Arminian prayer you could pray. But I prayed that, and nothing happened. And I thought, well, this doesn't work. And then I remembered the first, John 6, 37, if you come to Jesus, he will not turn you away. And I said, right, I've come, and I believe he will never turn me away. And there was no flashes of lightning, claps of thunder, funny mystical experience. It was a simple prayer of faith, and God heard it. I guess if there was anything subjective, I felt, I felt clean. 
And all the hate and all the bitterness and all the anger and rage that characterized my life, it, it went like that. You know, she, uh, the woman had said, that when you become a Christian, you've got to confess it to others. And that was a sticking point because I knew what I thought of Peter Thompson. And I knew what people said about Christians. But how was, how was I going to go out on Christmas morning and tell people that I was a Christian? Well, see, in the, the cell next door to me, there was a guy called Michael McGee, and we called him Shirley. We called him Shirley because he was a gossip. You know, women are always gossiping like. I know this isn't PC, but I knew if I told Shirley McGee in the next cell that he would tell everybody in the wing for me. And right enough, <laughs> Christmas morning, big guy, big prison officer, big shields, he open, opens my, my door, and I follow him to the next door where Shirley is. And he opens the door and I shout in, I became a Christian last night, and run back into my own cell. And right enough, true to form, Shirley told everybody in the wing for me that I was a Christian. By any way, it's a cop out, but that's how I ended up letting everybody know I was a Christian. Now, obviously, I rode out to family and friends and told them about this great change that had come into my life. What was the reaction of my family? My sister said, well, anything's better than communism. And the Christian bit is the next little sort of thing that he's going to be into. My mum was generally happy that I was a Christian. But I'll come back to this in a second. The girl who was writing to me, who came every day since 78, visiting me every week, the very first visit... I go into the visiting room and she's sitting and she's crying her eyes out. And she's saying, she's saying, you have ruined everything. And I say, what do you mean? She says, you've ruined everything. And she says, we, we will never be able to work. I say, what do you mean? What, what are you talking about? She says, it says in the Bible, you cannot be unequally yoked with a non-believer. I say, what are you talking about? She says, I'm a, you're a Christian, I'm not. I will never be a Christian. The Bible says we are unequally yoked. We cannot be together. I said, the Bible doesn't say that. And she says, it's 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. You go and read it. And I go back to my cell and read it, and right enough, there it is in black and white. So what do I do? I start looking for loopholes. That doesn't mean what it means. Okay, now my mom... Um, she uh, wrote a letter a few weeks after I became a Christian and then she was saying how could I talk about a God of love how could I talk about a God of forgiveness where was this great God of love this great God of forgiveness the night your dad was gone down in the street like a dog by those IRA scum and she had underlined it three times and she shared in the letter how she had met her, my dad after he came out of the forces in the second world war all their plans, all their hopes, all their dreams for the future, and how it all had all been shattered that night in June 70. And I sat down and I wrote a letter based in Romans 12, 19. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And I sent a covering letter to my younger sister, who was a Christian at professing faith and going to church. And I said, look, you got to get my mom. you got to get her to church with you. And... Letters come back and forward, but um, it was a few weeks later, I got a letter from my mom. I've still got the two letters today, and she opened it, and this is, this is what, how she opened it. I now know what you mean about God's forgiveness. Tonight at church, I became a Christian. And when I saw my mom saved, I saw a mountain moved, a mountain of hatred and bitterness that had accumulated over 10 years. And you see, when she was saved, she started singing again because God puts the song back into the life. And she's 94, and she's still singing God's praise. And, you know, God, that's the God we worship. That's the God we adore, the God who moves mountains. And the next five years in prison, I'm living out my life in that place as a believer, reading the Bible. It was about a few weeks after me, another couple of lads in the wing became Christians. 
And they said, Billy, you're, you've got three weeks more knowledge in us. Teach us everything that you've, you've learned in three weeks. <laughs> and so that's how I ended up beginning, you know, teaching a bit of the Bible. But everything I was taught in those early days, most of the prison officers were brethren guys. So it was uh, spoon-fed dispensationalism for years uh, before I eventually came to the Reformed faith uh, through the influence of some other prison officers. But, um, you know, just reading the Bible and the Bible saying you've got to be baptized, you know, we said, well, we've got to be baptized if the Bible says it. And four of us who were professing faith went down into, you know, the, the sort of the shower area, filled up the bath with water, and we baptized each other in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and to make sure that it was full, fully submerged, we had about half a dozen map buckets, and when we baptized each other, and when the water spills over, the other two was pouring the water on to make sure it was completely covered. And all the water was all over the place and going down the wing. And uh, when you got four guys in a bath, it raises suspicions, and this prison officer came over, he said, what are you doing? He said, we're baptizing each other because the Bible tells us to do it. And he says, well, I don't think that's allowed. But the Bible says it it's allowed or not. <laughs> so, yeah, now, you see, as I look back, I think it was a wee bit impetuous. I think we should have waited maybe until I got out and got baptized with, in the church. But when I got out, out of Fanchley and explain to the elders of the church what had happened. They said, yeah, well, as long as it was by immersion, it's a valid baptism. So uh, you, you can challenge me in that later if you like. But the girl's still writing, still visiting. She come up about a year after I'd become a Christian. And she said, right, this isn't going to work. It's other." And this is what she said. She said, I will do anything for you. Anything. She says, I, I, I will wait. I don't care how long you're in. I will wait. We will get till you get out and we'll get married. And I'll do anything for you. But you gotta you gotta check in Christianity. You gotta leave Christianity. I'm not gonna be a Christian and I'm not gonna marry a Christian. And I remember going back to the wing. You, know, kind, you go back from a visit, you're always happy. But boy, the, my maid saw me coming in. He says, what's wrong? And I said, just give me a choice. Christ or Christ or her. And uh, he turned around and he said to the other lads, you know, this is what you said. And one of them said, that's Satan, you know. I know these guys were Christians. And I went down to my cell, and it was very nearly her. And you know what made the difference? There was a, I had a hymn book in my cell. And I'm thinking, it's going to be the girl. You know, she's been writing to me every day since 1978, visit me every week. And I lifted the hymn book, and it just fell open at when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. And that last verse, were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so defined, demands my soul, my life, my all. And then um, I remember saying, Lord, if she's gonna go, make it as painless as possible. And then um, she went. And he did make it as painless as possible. It would take too long to explain what happened. But, um, you know, during the, just to, to fill in a couple of things for you, you know, during the whole hunger strike scenario, um, Rome's involvement in that, it's horrendous, you know. Uh, the wee woman who came down to my cell uh, and witnessed to me, she went round every part of that prison witnessing. She went to the hunger strikers and witnessed to them. And there was one of them she witnessed to. And um, she gave a little illustration about, you know, the three fingers, Christ and the middle cross. This one here recognized his sin, the, the, the cyst, but Christ covered the sin. 
And the prison officer, when he died on hunger strike, the prison officer was talking to Gladys and, she, and he said, you know, Gladys, when we went in, when he had died, he was lying in a really strange way. He was lying like that. And Gladys was saying, I wonder if he was sending me a message that I've accepted Christ. We don't know. But she wondered. There was a girl coming up to see one of the hunger strikers. And um, just like the girl who was coming up to see me, you know, I'll do anything for you. I just want to marry you. I don't want you dead. She was saying that to him every day. You've got to come off this hunger strike. I want you alive. I don't want you dead. And she took, she took them off it. And she came out of the ward. She said to the prison officer, he told me this. She said, get a priest, get a priest. He is coming off the hunger strike. If he had to come off the hunger strike, the hunger strike would have been broken. Get a priest, get a priest. He's coming off. Sid says it's not a priest you need, it's a doctor. And Sid flies down the wing, across to the other side of the hospital, gets a doctor, running back with a doctor, going down the wing, a priest from Manderson's town, you can Google his name, Father Toner, had that young girl by the throat up against the wall, saying he's staying on the hunger strike, he's not coming off, this is bigger than you. That young lad died on hunger strike. Rome's involvement in that whole episode is deplorable. I was released from prison in 1985, relatively short space of time for the seriousness of the crime that I was involved in. The following year, I went to the Irish Baptist College and studied for the ministry. It was while at the Irish Baptist College I met my wife, Roberta, and um, I got a second life sentence. We married in 1989. Only joking. God's good, isn't he? How he brings things together. But see, when I was at college, I'll finish with this. When I was at college, doing my student assistantship in the area where I grew up, the church where I did my assistantship was on the corner of the street where my dad was killed. And it was about November, I think probably November 88. It was a freezing night, really, really cold. We were doing door-to-door -door work in the area. And we'll go to this house, we're up the door. And this old man comes to the door, and he, I think he felt the icy blast. And he invited us into the house. So we go into the house, we're sitting down, we're chatting, and all of a sudden he starts to point to all of these different photographs in, in the living room. And then he turns and he points to a photograph beside him. It was in a lovely gilded frame of a young man, probably in his early 20s, an old black and white photograph. And he points to it and he said, and this one, he said, and this one's my brother. And still looking at the photograph, he said, you know, they shot him dead. And I said, who shot him dead? And still looking at the photograph, he says, the IRA shot him dead in 1935. He was walking home one night, and they just opened up, and they shot him dead. And I said to him, well, tell me this. How, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about it now? And this was 53 years after the offense. And he turned around, and he looked at us, and he said, look, I know you two men are from the church, and I don't want to offend you. But he says, I can tell you, I still hate them. Boy, and you could feel the hate. You could feel it as it came out of him. 53 years after the offense. And I said to him, well, I know what you're talking about. Because I was once acquainted with that hate. I knew it. 
I know the insatiable longing for revenge. And I also know the peace and the joy and the forgiveness that comes through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's the only one that can take away that mountain of hate, that cancer of hate. He's the only one that can come into a life that has been ruined and broken and put it back together again. 52 years, Monday week, my dad is killed. And you know, when I get up that Monday morning, I will go through every step of the day that I had with my dad those 52 years ago. That, you know, the pain doesn't go away. The questions don't go away. The heartache is still as raw as it was 52 years ago. And you see, were it not for the fact that Christ came in to my life, I would, be, I would have been working that hatred out in a way that would have been temperamental to the rest of society. I would have been engaged in the, in the taking of life. But you see, Christ makes a difference. Christ comes in to the heart and changes it. And he gives you a reason for living. And he gives you this wonderful gospel to preach, gospel of reconciliation, that sinful men can be reconciled to a holy and a righteous God. And we can sing glorious hymns like the hymn we sang at the, the start of the service. You know, thank God for Calvary. Because of Calvary, I no longer walk the roads that I once walked. And the next time that we'll sing in loving kindness, Jesus came. I know some people get some hang-ups over that because of the first, and I on a higher plane I dwell because it comes from the, holy, you know, the holiness movement. But friends, when you see when you, you've been dug from a pit and sat upon the rock, Christ Jesus, I on a higher plane I dwell, and with my soul I know it's well. Why? Because in loving kindness Jesus came, my soul in mercy, to reclaim. Thank you, Angus. Amen.